Jason Carson Price for Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. We're coming to you from the Nation Network studio built by Arbor Lee here at the iconic Wall Center downtown Vancouver. And if you're looking for meeting space, whether they be business or social, contact their team. Learn more sales at wallcenter.com. Matt Sikaris alongside Blake Price, Grady Sass, hitting switches, conducting things with intern Sean Chessman. We got a big show planned for you. And it's all brought to you by Applewood Auto Group. Apple Infinity in Langley's got the QX80, the big kahuna. I love the QX80. I, I would like a QX80. That's a lot of car. I would really like a QX80. Well, for your brood and everything that you travel if with, absolutely. Works for my lifestyle. I would get the 2024 QX80 leasing at 0.99% for 18 months on all trims and non stack cash of $9,000. Go find yours at Applewood Infinity in Langley. It's all good at Applewood. Whole question today. We are asking you. Who do you want to avoid in round one of the playoffs? We've asked the who do you want. Now, who do you want to avoid? Because, of course, there's still three options. Even after the Vancouver Canucks Mm -hmm. victory over the Calgary Flames, clinching the Pacific Division. You can vote for Los Angeles. You can vote for the Nashville Predators. You can vote for the Vegas Golden Knights. Or you can vote nobody. Bring it on. Do so. That's the Carson Price on Twitter and and I'm curious YouTube. about that last one. I'm curious how many people it's have doing pretty well in early voting. There's some bravado back. Hey, as we've and talked about, everybody's got warts here. Everybody's mm-hmm. got holes. If they were any better, they'd be higher in the standings. Well, I also think victories over the Vegas Golden Knights and Edmonton Oilers have brought some of the mojo back, some of the feelings, some of the confidence level. Matt, I think the Two Vegas thirds uh, of poll respondents told us Monday that they're confident in the Canucks heading into the playoffs. I think the Vegas Golden Knights either win their series or they lose in five. Like, I don't know if there's much in between there. I, I like they've not played a lot of good hockey here of late. And it's hard for, even for them as old and banged up as they are. Mm-hmm. I don't know that they can just flick that switch and be the dominant selves. I would have thought yeah. they'd try that in the last mm-hmm. couple of weeks and they really weren't successful in getting that done. I hear you, but I think they're going to beat the Anaheim Ducks. And in so doing, they're going to be third place in the Pacific Division. So that's a heck of a draw against the Edmonton Oilers. I voted Vegas on the poll for two reasons. Number one, they just scare me. The collection of talent they have, plus the Stanley Cup experience from winning last year. But also... I just could not stomach if Mark Stone returns in game one of the playoffs and they win the series. I am eyeballs with this LTIR overage. Well, for him, it's been particular. 20 some million in yeah. his case and in this franchise's case. Three straight years of as it. well. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I think the Kings scare me the most because when you reduce games to, one goal games every right. single time. Those are, you know, the spontaneous bounces of a frozen rubber disc. One stroke of luck can win a hockey game and change the series. I hear you. Plus that one, three, one is horrible to watch. Yeah. And the Canucks haven't solved it. And after waiting this long for playoff hockey to mm-hmm. have that be right. your, your re-entry into regular playoff hockey, the Kay. LA Kings. Oh, now you, do, you deserve better than that. Probably going to be low scoring games. Right? Across the board, you mean? It, well, in the playoffs, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Really? In the early going, the first two rounds, okay. like if it's Canucks Oilers in the second round, that, that wouldn't be low scoring. I, uh, I mean, I watched Capitals Flyers last night, and that was tight. Yeah. You know, effectively a playoff game. And it says a 2 1 final, tight. Andrew Burnett doesn't coach defensive hockey. In fact, right? I, I don't think. Uh, I'm not sure the Flyers had a shot on goal in the opening eight or so minutes. Canucks versus Preds would would have goals. They really would. I I I think the Vegas Golden Knights would be a, a grind, and certainly the Kings would be a grind. But mm-hmm. I think there's a possibility for some fun hockey. So who did you vote? You voted LA. Yeah, I'll go. I'll well, yeah, I'll go LA. But I, I don't begrudge the people that say bring it on because no. it, because there's a, there's enough holes in all no. these up op- in all these bits of opposition that yeah. I think you can picture the Canucks yeah. winning. Yeah. And as we have said for some time, it, you know, and it sounds like coach speak because it is, but you know, 
take care of your own business. Control what you can control. Mm -hmm. If the Vancouver Canucks go out there and play their best hockey, I with you. I think they can beat any of these teams. And is Cam Talbot really going to be a top flight goalie? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Grady, where are you at? I'm going to LA. Mm -hmm. The one three one. The fact that the Canucks didn't lead for a single second of any game this year. Yep. Now the playoffs are a different beast, but and I'd like to think over a seven game series that the Canucks top end talent would be able to find a way to get four wins. But man, that team just knows how to suffocate teams. And until the Canucks can show something and maybe that's in a playoff series against them, then I'm going to side as I'm going to take the Kings as a team. And, and you say okay. that they know how to suffocate them. And I, I know we, the Canucks fans have seen it. So they feel it the most. But if they really knew how to suffocate teams, would they be more than a 37 regulation win team? Would they be mm -hmm. more than a 97 point team at this point? Well, it like, doesn't always work, right? Like you got to pierce through that three check wall at center ice. Canucks showed in glimpses they can. Glimpses. But that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Got to be able to at least hold the lead and win more. Let's get to our top story brought to you by Douglas Demko returns. Canucks win. Division clinched, conference next, question mark. A 4-1 victory over the Calgary Flames on fan appreciation night at Rogers Arena, their final home game of the 23-24 season, and they achieved that 50th victory that we had talked about. They achieved the Pacific Division crown, which we have talked about. It's the first time they've ever won the Pacific Division, and it's their first division title since 2013. Two back of first place in the West. They need Dallas to lose in regulation against the St. Louis Blues on Wednesday, in which case they would have an opportunity to finish first in the Western Conference with a victory at Winnipeg on Thursday. Yeah. We, yeah, wish for that at your own peril. Again, if you're aiming for the Preds, and I think I think half the fan base is probably aiming for the Preds and Half the fan base is split between the others, maybe. Um, but you, the only way you're getting the Preds is winning the Pacific Division and finishing second in the conference. So, got to be careful what you wish for. Um, I, I think so. You don't see value in home ice in the conference final. You don't see value in the perhaps confidence boost you would get from finishing atop the Western. Conference. Hey, whatever happens, happens tomorrow night in Winnipeg. But if I'm the Vancouver Canucks, I rest a couple players. Um, the players that are I, the star players that I have in my lineup are playing mm -hmm. 15 minutes. Yep. Um, and then if you happen to win that game, I mean, mm -hmm. whatever, that means Winnipeg rolled over. Um, but I, I don't think you need to come out with playoff like intensity mm -hmm. tomorrow in order to win the Western Conference. No. So I'm, uh, I'm going to put you on ease and O's. Why? Well, when talking about resting players in this Winnipeg game, if nothing were at stake, you mentioned don't even put Quinn Hughes on the plane. Mm -hmm. They leave today, of course. Mm -hmm. We won't know the Dallas result till tonight. Yeah. So Hughes is on the plane. He's probably going to come other. on the plane. Yeah. yeah. No, he's. But why am I? Why around. is that an E and O? I didn't say well, that will happen. Him, you said leave him at home. Yeah. Well, there's, that was no, an opinion. there's no world where you can leave him at home. It's not an E and O, but it hasn't happened yet. So. Okay. I'm quite sure he's going to be on the plane later. But I also didn't say he will not be getting on the plane. No. Then it's an EO. No, but you said leave him at home. There's no world where they're going to leave him at home because they won't know the result. I didn't think they're going to arrive in Winnipeg before the Dallas Stars game even faces. Even off. when I said that, I didn't think they would actually do it. It's been a long season, folks. <laughs> <laughs> like honestly, nitpicking, uh, sick you know, honestly, like a household sometimes. We'll figure Where it out. Just get sick of each other. Anyways, moving right along. We're going to hear from Coach. Uh, Thatcher Demko, 39 saves in his return after missing more than a month. He'll have one more tune-up before the playoffs start. And the Canucks played a first half game last night. Like they, That was, that was right. the first half Vancouver Canucks. They allowed a lot of shots. They right. got out shot. Scored a bunch of goals uh, early. On, like we're on, not threatened on the scoreboard, even though they were threatened on the chances. shot clock. Yeah, they were medium high quality. Like yep. they were still from distance. So those were yep. shoots and scores goals. Mm -hmm. And to score uh, a bunch of them, that's crazy. Like, yeah, it's a nice shot by JT and the pretty passing by 
Elias, Ilya. And but in 37 for the, for the goal Dakota for... Joshua goals, a no. shoots and scores goal from yeah. distance, too. And the, the Myers one. Well, yeah. Myers. Yeah. The three from the circle. So, I mean, good, good on them. How do you think Jacob Markstrom's feeling these days? And, and Myers short handed. Yeah. Well, well, the way he snuck away. Yeah. And Bluger just kind of waited until he had a. How does there that blocker how side? How does six eight sneak behind the defense? That was pure chaos. Well, do you see the distance though? <laughs> the uh, the the like Myers had a lot of room to shoot that. That but Markstrom was way over committed to that side of the net. Mm-hmm. Like there was a foot there for him to was, shoot. At. Wasn't our old friend Jake's uh, best night? No, no, to say the least. I don't think he's feeling too great about how things have played. Out. Uh, I don't think so either. either. His uh, heart's not in it. fact, no. if, if if and we know Jake, uh, we got to know Jake. He's a feeler. He's a feeler. All the feels. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, kind of a manic guy. His highs are really high. His lows. Do you remember how he used to beat himself up in those post games? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you'd sit there and watch him and go, "Boy, Jacob, you were the reason it was close tonight." And yet he'd be sitting there in the in the post game, just post morning himself and just tearing strips off his performance. I would not be in the least bit surprised to hear Jacob Marsham request a trade. In the off season. Oh, for sure. That if this is oh, heading to rebuild, it's... and of course, at, at one point already traded to New Jersey, right? Kiboshed above Craig Conroy. So I would not be surprised to see Jacob Markstrom uh, head off to greener pastures. And of course, if you're the Calgary Flames, you 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 look at it and you say, hey, we got uh, two pretty good goaltenders in reserve. Daniel Ladar, who's got another season left on his contract. And of course the uh, young up and comer, Mm -hmm. Dustin Wolf. How fitting would it be though, if that's his final game as a flame and he loses to the team that he left in free agency and loses to the goaltender that ultimately took his starting job. And this team that he kind of was there for the, some of the, the tough betting years. And Mm -hmm. of course they got the bubble, but you know, this team has found this extra gear now and just watching it all, Right, play out in front of him. The devils might double back on that. Who knows? But of course, um, him at that freight here, I'm not sure the team heads in this direction. His underlying stats weren't terrible, especially for the first half of the season. His underlying stats were great. In fact, until recently, Jacob Markstrom, uh, you could make a case for, was amongst the three to five best goalies in the league this year. But he has fallen All right, off. Let's, uh, That's the uh, top story brought to you by Douglas Mattresses. Uh, order yours today, douglas.ca slash Canucks Army. And don't forget, it comes with a free comfort sleep on. No matter what mattress you order, you're going to get that. Two memory foam pillows, pillow protector, luxurious cotton sheet set, and a mattress protector free with any mattress order. These are Canadian handcrafted, highest quality materials delivered quickly to you and oh, so comfortable keeping you cool in those summer, hot summer nights as well. Order yours today, douglas.ca slash Canucks Army. We're going to hear from Rick Tockett on the victory, but more meaningfully, what the victory means. And listen closely here towards the end, because there's something, there's a card here that he plays that we have not heard the Canucks play very much this year, even though they've had grounds to. Here's Coach on the win. Yeah, I, I, I honestly, I'm just happy we won the Pacific Division. I mean, the guys did a hell of a job all year. I mean, obviously, let's face it, nobody really picked us to win the division. I think so. You got to give the, the players a lot of credit. The game wasn't a Picasso, obviously, but um, you got to take the positive. You know, we won the Pacific tonight, so um, really happy for the guys. Really, like it's a, it's, a, it's a big honor, and uh, the guys should enjoy it. I'm so impressed with so many things Rick talked at this year. But I wanted to highlight the, let's face it, nobody picked us. Mm. Because here's the thing. Old school coaching, in many coaching handbooks, the us against the world theme, the nobody picked us, the aggrieved mentality is a very easy. I mean, it's textbook textbook stuff, right? Well, he didn't use it with us, but I wonder how many times he used it behind closed doors. He, well, he, he may have motivated uh, them uh, with that. But, Blake, if he had used it a lot behind closed doors, you know hockey players as well as I do, oftentimes they parrot the coach. Mm-hmm. We didn't hear a lot of that, of nope, course. Of the Even though the Vancouver Canucks absolutely had the grounds to say, nobody picked us, maybe outside of Frank Cervelli, but even Frank says, 
you know, picked them to get in, not win the division. Yeah. There were there was nobody out there at the beginning of the year saying the Canucks are going to win the division over the defending Stanley Cup champions and the uh, Stanley Cup co-favorites. But I can picture Rick Tocca saying, of Edmonton. don't say that to, you know, you know, I'm going to say that, that yeah, nobody guys, picked us, but don't don't say that publicly. Don't say that frontward facing because right. we're going to come off as whiners exactly. and all that sort of stuff. That's we, for we us. Don't to want, use. We don't want grievance to be our brand. No. Because that's and, not you know, the way let, he was. Let's not. No, exactly. And, no. and let's not, you know, fuel that narrative. Yeah. In some cases, it's too on the nose. Well, it's too on the nose for yeah, previous Canuck brands. Yeah. I mean, as great as the Mike Gillis era Canucks were, mm -hmm. they got painted as winers. But, but the other thing that I like about it, break, uh, Blake, is if you play that card, it insinuates a finality that you've achieved something. Mm -hmm. And what's Rick talk had been about since he took over with the Canucks? We haven't done nothing yet. Yeah. He's played the, you know, these guys think they're good, you know, and they oh, still you want respect in this. Thing? Guess what? You yeah. know, win a whole bunch. Yeah. So it hasn't fit with his personal narrative and communication about the task at hand. And he resisted the temptation because I'm sure there were people, I'm sure there are people in the building today. I'm sure there are people getting in his ear over the course of the year mentioning it ah nobody picked you nobody thought you were any good and take a look at what has transpired but in a lot of ways what he's saying too is we aren't anything until we are something that's well, that's you know, it like that's it like it's not about that, whining oh. it's 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 just factual no, even well, even at, at 50 wins great you know ask the boston bruins how great when you how many would they win last exactly. year 55 or whatever you know it doesn't matter and they still haven't done anything, but, you know, hey, they, they put themselves in a great position to have some success for the first time in a long time. Well, yeah, but also, again, we won the Pacific Division. Great. Now we need to win four rounds of the playoffs. Like, that's ultimately the goal. Mm -hmm. What happened here during the course of the 82-game regular season is achievement. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the last hurdle. Nope. In a lot of ways you've played this great season to get to a starting block, totally. not a finish line. No. So uh, I've just been so mightily impressed. Uh, I've had good fortune to cover uh, a lot of head coaches in a lot of different sports. And there are very few coaching jobs that I've seen firsthand that I think are better than the job that Rick Tockett has done this season. And if you go to the preseason, looking at the Vegas odds, Mm -hmm. The Edmonton Oilers, Vegas Golden Knights, Los Angeles Kings, Calgary Flames, and Seattle Kraken. Yeah, all, all of with them. shorter odds than the Canucks. Only the Sharks and Ducks were below them. So I they mean, proved it to the bookies. They proved it to the rest of the, the league. They proved it to the media. And probably they proved it to themselves. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Uh, they would never admit it. I guarantee you, after all the losing that's transpired here, there were a few guys in the room at the beginning of the year going, yeah, not sure. But, Even know, I'll say it. I'll parrot it. You know, like is hope springs eternal, but probably not. I'm not sure we're better. You know, have made the necessary improvements that we need to make to be a playoff team, let alone a division winner. Well, that's the thing, right? Well, How many of them actually <laughs> thought that they had a legit chance? No, many winning first in the division. No, many. Probably no. They I probably. I think they had more. Uh, we're going to be a playoff team this year. I think yes. they probably have a a quiet confidence of that in their souls, but uh, I don't think they would have reached this far. And you know, I'm not surprised all those teams were ahead of all those teams were ahead of them the previous season. Like Calgary was ten points better than them last year and mm. still missed the playoffs. And again, they win. Seattle tomorrow night. was seventeen points better and made the final eight. They win tomorrow night. It's the second best season in Canuck history. Yeah, tied for. Then there's this from NHL PR. The Canucks clinched the Pacific Division after holding top spot for 120 days. Only two other teams held top spot in their division for longer. The Rangers at 177 days. And of course, they won the 
Division, Conference, and Presidents Trophy. And the Boston Bruins had 159 days. And here's the funny thing about Boston. They lose their last two. Florida wins their last four. And uh, Boston did not finish in top spot in the Atlantic Division. Missed out by a point. We'll play the Leafs in the first round. That's a delicious series. All the Florida Tampa yeah. in the first round, the Battle of Florida yet again. Carolina and Islanders and the Rangers Capitals are your Eastern Conference matchups, all locked in stone with the final regular season games for teams in that conference going here on Wednesday. 1v8. It's the old conference style, too. All the, all the, yeah, all no, the complaints exactly. about all oh, one v eight. No, exactly. This is the this same exactly lineup. Exactly would have it would have been the exact same in a one v eight. So uh, you know, in another universe, uh, Leaf fans would be complaining again about getting Boston Bruins. Oh, it's so tough. Why do they change the playoff format? No, you'd still be here, same spot. Here's JT Miller, the team MVP, the team most exciting player, discussing the achievement of winning the Pacific Division. It's just nice to see, you know, we're not where we want to be yet, but, you know, but when you have the whole team come in and we all buy into getting summer over with a month earlier than normal and come in and put the work in and, you know, really come together, this is certainly part of the process, right? And uh, we play a lot of good hockey this year. We should be proud. Yeah, they should be. <laughs> and they've uh, they've had their back up against the wall a couple of times, mm -hmm. and they've answered it twice. They had the, the five-game scuffle a month and a half ago. They came out of it, right? mm -hmm. and that's about as deep as you want to go. Four or five game losing streak. That's about as far as you want to go on a, team, on a season where you want to accomplish big things. And then again, right, right before this recent four game stretch, back looked like it was against the wall. Oilers getting close, and what they do? They responded with three zero and one stretch here that has put them back into the driver's seat and uh, a division title. So um, that's a good sign for the playoffs. The fact that they've They've responded well to the adversity that they've been handled, uh, handed, and uh, mm -hmm. and of course now with Demko back, that's a bit of an adversity tonic. Mm -hmm. There was, and I'm not sure if this was out there before yesterday, but I saw an Ian McIntyre's call, call in the Quinn Hughes in a group text, basically challenging everybody to get back into Vancouver earlier than hockey players typically arrive. Mm -hmm. And to, be, to put the best foot forward, and uh, JT Miller apparently followed up on that text. And so you had all these guys who centralized earlier with a mission. And so that's got to feel pretty good. After all, we're accustomed to this team by this time of the calendar dispersing, all going their separate ways. As Philip Ronick would say, you have holidays in two days. Great bit of camera and audio work. Oh my goodness. So good. Because when you go down and the game was on delay. That was like three minutes after the whistle. Like he was still, well, while they were just, reviewing the play, he was hanging out there forever. The, yeah, <laughs> chirping. Of course, the, the game is on delay. So you do have a mini window there in case something is set. Because when you go down to ice level with the mics, you oftentimes are going to hear some things that the general public will not accept. And so to catch that moment of a clean chirp like that, very well done. The only downside of that whole comment or that whole scene is this is the guy that always begs off of interviews because he couldn't possibly, he yeah. doesn't speak well, English. Come on. No, Loud I don't know. and clear. They never use, they've never used that he doesn't speak English. He just doesn't want to talk. He just doesn't want to talk. He can talk just fine. Right. <laughs> When I heard that, just fine. when I heard that last night, I told Robert, the Canucks Army social guy, I'm like, you gotta clip that. Oh, for sure, sure enough, it goes viral. And then YVR Airport this morning, so. us reminding you to pre-book your airport parking. Quote tweeting the caption of, "You have holidays in two, two days." days. <laughs> the actual YVR Airport. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Great chirp. All right. So. Uh, nobody's going to get up in arms about this. It's a uh, popularity contest. But JT Miller got the team MVP, not Quinn Hughes. JT Miller got the most exciting player, not Quinn Hughes. Of course, he's got best defenseman. And for a second straight year, the, you're reigning, defending, unsung hero, Dakota Joshua. Sung so much last year that he won the award. Mm -hmm. Because he won the award. Two years in a row, unsung. 
by as we've said by very definition that shouldn't be the case yeah you gave him an award mm-hmm. last year hence you sung him mm-hmm. and he had a better year this year trust me we know who he is Rinkwide guys were talking about it last night saying how these team awards should be split up amongst the players voting the media voting and the Canucks management voting, along with some of the fans. No, so first of all, give fans most exciting. Exactly. No, no. Uh, no, no. Let fans vote. Sure. No, I never Even said if they, they can't produce vote. results that you know management, players, media look at and go, "Well, that's curious." No, no. no. Let them vote. I just don't get it. This is gonna... they're the engine of the league. They're the engine of the team. They're the engine of the market and the building. Quinn Hughes is going to win an, a, a league-wide award that yeah, no, no Canuck has even flirted with in 50-plus years of existence. And, and really, it, is, it matters not. I am sure he is not. No, probably not. This. Probably not. No. Unflappable. In fact, bringing it back to JT Miller, I've, I've heard that JT finds it utterly amazing how buttoned down Quinn Hughes is like they are polar they get along yeah. but but by all, they're just totally they're like JT Miller is the beer after the game kind of guy mm-hmm. and Quinn Hughes is uh no I'm gonna go study Skin, skinless chicken just like he is mm-hmm. so serious mm-hmm. um he's everything well, he, he's everything his face looks like it yeah is. oh for sure <laughs> you know like well his his father's a hard hockey man yeah by all accounts and Quinn's about that hockey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, JT gets the team MVP, and he was asked about it in the post game. Take a listen. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I would say a year or two ago, it wasn't exactly that way. So, um, you know, that's not the reason that we play, but at the same time, it's very nice to, you know, it's a special thing to be recognized by the fans that way. And uh, such a passionate fan base, you know, I can relate to that. So, you know, it means a lot. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I. It has to feel good, and he alluded to it there. It has to feel good that he has made this transformation from yeah, I was just being a villain yeah. with some segments of the fan base, you know, being the loud, obnoxious guy who's getting on teammates and embarrassing them publicly. In some ways, this is parole for good to, behavior. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, and, and you know, look, there's been a couple of transformations in JT's career. We've talked about how when he got traded here, it was very much a wake-up call. Third organization, a couple of teams had given up on him, knew he had to be a harder worker, really dedicate and commit to the game. And he's realized all of his talent since doing that. The second transformation is you can't be the Popovsky as often as he was being the Popovsky, especially in the light of cameras, microphones, and fans. And the good thing is, and is that it, it's, it's a good attribute to, to have. The pop, uh, Popping off every mm-hmm. once in a while, it's a good card to have, but you can't, it's it's the boy who cried wolf thing. You can't play it all the time, mm-hmm. loses its effectiveness and becomes really annoying. Mm-hmm. But having, having that temper is going to be useful, but you use that superpower when you need to. Not every other night. And he figured out the, the right happy medium there. I uh, recently uh, caught, again, the I Hate Chris Christian Leitner documentary. They played every mm. March about the former Duke basketball star. And he gets drafted to the NBA, and he goes and he plays in Minnesota, which is a dreadful franchise. Uh, Sidney Lowe was the head coach, right. former Grizzly. Mm. And Sidney Lowe calls up Coach K down at Duke one day and says, boy, Leitner, Gotta say, he's a what do I different do cat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Shashevsky tells him, "Think of him like a fire. If channeled properly, he'll heat the whole building. Yes. If channeled improperly, he'll burn he'll it all burn it all. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And I think some of and full and here's another element where I think the most credit goes to JT Miller, but I think you also have to credit Rick Tockett in large degree. Oh yeah, they got through to him mm-hmm. and channeled all of that emotion properly efficiently this year yeah and i think talk it being a an ex-player with some fire himself probably helped to uh make some of those points hit home with jt miller not to mention some of the increased responsibility you're, we're gonna line match it you're gonna play the tough matchup so it, it just a a magnificent coaching job from front to back from rick talk and his group all right uh 
rest, resting players. And again, won't know until later Wednesday evening whether or not Dallas uh, wins their game and puts an end to the Western Conference. Could be something to play for tomorrow. Could not. Coach Tockett was asked about resting players. Take a listen. You know, talk to the group, talk to the trainers, uh, see who's banged up. Um, there's a lot of factors involved, and, uh, you know, we can't make them in five minutes, but we're going to have to do some research and figure the best way to handle this. But, yeah, you know, you always want to you always want to win every game, but you also there's precautionary things, too. Everybody at practice today, normal lines, mm-hmm. no more normal pairings, so nothing to work off of there at practice. Is Besser the biggest candidate, though, Kier? He's had some maintenance With the maintenance days. days you He's think. had his 40 goals. And as it was reminded uh, yesterday by mm-hmm. whom, or, or no, it was, it was somebody else, but, you know, the um, just because you're in the lineup, mm-hmm. doesn't mean you play a lot. I mean, uh, the other night versus San Jose, yep. Connor McDavid had four shifts. Uh, in the third period. So, you know, you can still have guys there. Yeah. JT Miller's going to play, but he's going to play 14 minutes. You know, Elias Patterson's yep. going to play, but he's going to play 14 minutes. So, um, it means a heavy night for Nils Oman. <laughs> you yeah. know, you know, for Vasily Pod Coles, and he's going to play hey, PP1. Fair you enough. Know? Like, fair enough. You know, there's other ways Blake. to get through this while everybody's still there. Well, Blake, I'm, I'm reminded, and look, there is, of course, a very slim chance that the Vancouver Canucks are going to go to the Stanley Cup final this year. That's a very big ask. Only two teams get that. Uh, of, yes. the, of the team. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you go back to that 2011 run where the Canucks played 25 games, right? You play a maximum of 28. The Canucks played 25 games. And what did every single 2011 Canuck tell us from Ryan Kessler to Chris Higgins to Dan Hughes to Mason Raymond to Corey Sh- On and on it went. They all said to us, oh, my God, thank God PX has scored in game five against San Jose, because if that series had to go for further, we're not sure how it would have turned out. No, We had guys like Kessler valiantly playing through everything. Uh, Higgins told us what he was going through at one point. Then, of course, you get to the final, you lose Raymond, you lose Ham Hughes, uh, in part because of the total buildup of all the knocks that they had suffered. Ask Dan Boyle about that series. He was convinced the better team lost there. Like Dan Boyle felt like absolutely robbed in that series. I like Dan Boyle a lot. We're from the same hometown. We're roughly the same age. We have friends in common, but Dan is mayor of wrong. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it, the puck came off a stanchion. There was an element of luck involved in how that. Oh, I, sure. Yeah. I think they're still sore about all the penalties that they were yeah, the previous for game, in yeah. game four and yeah. Sammy Sallow and the big blast from the point. That's when defenseman point shots in the playoffs or power thing. play were yeah. a big, big thing. I mean, Al McKinnis effectively won a cup yeah. for Calgary because people were scared of his shot. And Sammy's Sammy's shot could put the fear of God in you as well. Okay, so uh rest. We'll see. Um Patrick Johnson with a tweet last night. And look, there has been a lot of rumor and innuendo on this. We still don't know firm information, everybody. We probably won't know firm information for another 48 hours yet. Maybe 36. But he's hearing the first round series on Sunday, April 21st would be game one. Um, Many were saying earlier this week that they thought it would be as late as Tuesday, April 23rd, which Didn't believe is it. a significant break if, in fact, it's the Nashville Predators because yeah. they would go eight days between games. You can't punish. You You drew up the schedule for the Nashville Predators. Right. You told them that they're done on the Monday, and, and now you're, you're going to tell them that they have to wait and, eight days? And Blake, Sorry, I no. hear you. I hear you. But they drew the schedule up for 31 other teams as well. And the fact of the matter is they have to kowtow to some of their broadcasters' preferences. And it's probably going to mean that some team feels hard done by here, either with a quick turnaround or too long a layoff. Now, again, if you're a team that has designs on four rounds, 
that is a perennial cup contender, I think you absolutely want that break for everything we just outlined with the 2011 Canucks. And everything. You're talking about the, the the break for the Canucks or the, as long as no, the Preds? I don't no. think the one, I don't think the Preds. Uh, well, I'm not sure that applies to the Nashville Predators, but I think the Rangers were done on Monday as well. Like by all rights, the Rangers should probably play Saturday. But if they get the long break, I don't think Peter Laviolette is too worried about it. I think he'd much prefer to have a healthy rested group going in because they got designs on a long playoff run. Um, I don't mind this for the Canucks, though, if it starts Sunday, because it's a short flight from Winnipeg. It's not a terrible flight. It's, well, it was, it's two time zones. It's not but the it's same a, as Nashville. But it's a it's a it's a 28 hour road trip. Like it's like a, you're, mm-hmm. you were, you didn't even, you won't even adjust to Pacific time, like it'll little it, okay. or to central time. So it's, you just stay on Pacific time. You're back in two seconds. It's a meaningless game. Um, and you're back in your bed, probably at 1 AM mm-hmm. in your bed at 1 AM on Friday morning. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then you've got a pretty normal few days here before you have to play again. Yeah. So I, I don't think that's a terrible turnaround for the Canucks. I think okay. they could deal with that. So you think Sunday's better than Tuesday? I think Sunday's better than Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. Monday is the perfect start time, but in, if I'm given Sunday or Tuesday as the options, I think Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one more note here on awards. Quinn Hughes is the Canucks nominee for the NHL's King Clancy Memorial Trophy. The award goes to the player who best exemplifies leadership qualities on and off the ice and has made a noteworthy humanitarian contribution in his community. And let's underline that part. The noteworthy humanitarian contribution in the community every nhl team has a leader or several who exhibits the leadership qualities but um, making your mark in the community is something that has long been a part of the vancouver canucks remember talking to brian burke it's a non-negotiable right our players have to be in the community they have to be engaged and uh of course there were a couple of swedish twins in this community that effectively built hospitals they have been so yes. involved so yeah following in the uh great example set by the sedines and trevor linden and others quinn hughes your king clancy memorial trophy nominee for the vancouver canucks not to be confused with the mark that's the leadership award <laughs> right that that's a separate thing yes we get to award season you have your team awards then you have your league awards. Then you have the one league award that is not in the voting with the rest of the awards. Somehow the GMs vote on Vesna as opposed to the. It was also the PA award. Hockey. Then, well, the, the PA award, uh, you know, the PA MVP. Yeah. Ted Lindsay now, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And then these other awards that the NHL tells you about. It's, it's a lot. It's an interest. And still. Which is why we don't need it a ceremony. No plans for an award show. And no one <laughs> cares. No one cares. Do you, do you not think the winners care? Like, I'm. we were both children of the 80s to watch Gretzky and the uh, Tux, the ruffled. Matt, you've tux, seen them go up the and get those trophy. awards. Do you not think the player in retirement doesn't feel... Um doesn't feel warm and fuzzy about the still photograph of them on stage with the trophy beside them giving the speech. I would think that's something that winners of NHL awards hold near and dear. I just don't make it, don't make it have a banquet then, but don't put it on TV. It's not a TV show. It's a terrible DD. These are not exuberant personalities. Most often than not that want to give a, a, you know, a, an emotion-soaked um, speech. It's just not a TV show. So, yeah, the, you want to put on funny suit and go to a uh, you know a, a four-course meal? Sure, go do that. Fill you your wanna, boots. You, you don't want to. You don't want an award show with like a musical interlude. You want like System of the Down, Creed, something. Right? Like, yeah. No. Jim Blossoms. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Jim Blossoms always do NHL. If it goes two years without a Jim Blossoms concert, put on by the NHL, then it's gone too long. Hey, different strokes for different folks. Takes all kinds to make the world go round. I can listen to it. Comes to musical taste. We apologize to the Jim Blossoms (laughs) who do fine work. Okay. We've been telling you about these t-shirts because this year 
we have an army and nation gear ready to gear you up for Vancouver's playoff run. You can rep your team, shop the exclusive. We have an army playoff tee and more at nationgear.ca. Let's get to today's menu. And it's brought to you by our friends at Greta. And for those who missed the announcement earlier in the week, uh, yes, there was an event planned for Thursday at Greta. We are rescheduling that, and we're looking at doing that for a playoff road game. So as soon as we get that playoff schedule, we'll have more to say and let you know when we're going to gather at Greta for a fantastic watch party. It is the place to be, 50 West Cordova. Good food. Good times. Of course, there's the arcade. Yeah, we haven't gone toe to toe yet in the arcade. We should, uh, we should do pop a shot. Yeah. The basketball game, which is quite popular. Sure. Boy, I couldn't believe uh, how many people were playing on all um on all available hoops and with lineups. That was very pop. We should do pop a shot. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Span, watch out. Oh, air hockey the thing. Mm, it's a beautiful air hockey table. I haven't played air hockey in some time. Oh, yeah. The last time I'm I really played air speed. hockey, I was terrible. And then I realized it's age and reflexes. I'm like, why did I used to be better at this? Ah, no, old eyes don't work, brain doesn't work. It's an aerobic reflexes activity. Doesn't. Air hockey is an aerobic activity, it's a lot of movement. A lot of movement, but I you're on for pop a shot. Mm -hmm. Do they have any putting? No, I didn't see any. No, there's driving, you do driving game. Driving. Oh, yeah, I was just hoping for a putting game. Oh, mm -hmm. we'll do that today. Mm -hmm. Like my chances, anyways. <laughs> we'll see you at Grata 50 West Cordova. Blake is a horrific putter and he's the guy who will leave like the seventh putt of the round short and then just start lambasting himself including first person references mm -hmm. it sinks in more if you're you, used you know person. you know it's going poorly for mm -hmm. someone in your golf group when they start referring to themselves in the first person what are you doing Blake Come exactly on. Blake why don't you just leave another putt short that's true these but things I, happen. I'm on the upwards trajectory. Frank Corrado is going to join us. Former Vancouver Canuck. He will remind the YouTube audience of all of that because he broke out some gear, some old school Canuck gear for the appearance on the show. Uh, we'll also talk to Rob Williams, Rob, the hockey guy, because, of course, you know, Rob is scanning the city. For everything playoffs, we're still awaiting playoff announcements from Canuck Sports Entertainment. We're still awaiting whether there will be viewing parties. I sure hope there's viewing parties, and I sure hope they're done responsibly. So we got those two fellas coming up. Frank Corrado is next. Great Clips is the official hair salon of the National Hockey League. There are 37 salons in Vancouver and the Lower Mainland, all Canadian-owned and operated. Download the app and find the nearest to you when you're up next for a cut you'll get a ready next text great clips it's gonna be great hey you no not not you you are you uh you an owner operator you have a fleet of trucks or cars well cal pro plus might be the dedicated tire program just for you free program includes exclusive deals and savings price match guarantee flexible financing and preferred pricing on everything you drive also you get a dedicated member support line that means that you can get questions answered also they'll source and recommend the right tire for you your application and your budget. Cal Tires Network of 260 plus stores are here to help so you can focus on the road ahead. Sign up for free at calproplus.com. Our next guest, a presentation of the Arnold Palmer. Is there something off with the audio? No. I heard a small echo up there. Computer. Is it your. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at my computer. Go phone. to your settings, your audio settings. Yeah. And there should be a little. Um, dial that you can turn down the mic volume, even if your mic is muted. Yeah, you right. got to turn your mic volume all the way down. Okay, all right, better now. Okay, okay, Fire sorry, away. Frank. 
Our next guest, a presentation of the Arnold Palmer Design Whistler Golf Club, counting down to opening day on May 10th. The Bears are back. You can follow all the progress at Whistler Golf on social. And the club reminds organizers of groups of 12 or more. Get on in now. Those prime times are filling up fast. And just for just for reserving that tea time, you, the organizer, plays for free. Whistler Golf Club takes care of the rest. Tell us about your group, whistlergolf.com slash groups. You see, Frank Corrado, he played for three different NHL teams, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. the uh, Vancouver Canucks, the Toronto Maple Leafs, and the Pittsburgh Pengu- Penguins. And we had a couple listeners say, hey, Frankie, he's got the Leafs jersey in the back of his setup. Where's all the Canucks gear? There's the Canucks and he gear. joins us now in full Canucks regalia. How come you don't have any advertising on the helmet, Frank? <laughs> there's there's no ads. This is pre-advertising. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I figured I'd bring it back for one one last go. If you'll notice, my chin strap is undone because a lot of times I would just take warm up. So my chin strap <laughs> actually never got done up for the entire night. Is uh, that went on? Helmet went mm-hmm. off, and yeah. no chin strap was done up. <laughs> That's fine. Is that a team issue? He doesn't uh, have his ears in. Wait, wait till he gets his ears back is in. Is that there a you. team issue Canucks zip up that I'm seeing? Like, it is does. that something? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, hold on a sec. This is not only team issued. This is playoff. It's it was a playoff specific one. Oh, oh is, yeah. Wow. This is playoff specific. So uh, apropos we had timing, here. sweaters mm-hmm. done up. Yeah, yeah. Which well, which brings me to my. First question, uh, your rookie season in the National Hockey League, you play four playoff games for the Vancouver Canucks. What's it like to be on the ice as a playoff performer in front of this audience, this market at Rogers Arena? It was crazy. It was crazy. I got I was like still can remember stepping onto the ice for the first time, feeling those goosebumps, feeling the energy in the building. I'm pretty sure they had the towels, like there were the white towels going. Mm-hmm. If I remember correctly, it was um, one of the coolest moments that I'll, I'll ever, you know, uh, experience in my hockey career. And unfortunately, we weren't even able to win a game in that entire series. So, you know, it a it, little bit of a sour note in that regard, but um, just, you know, the culmination of kind of getting to that point, um, in your career and being able to experience the, the NHL playoffs is a, it's a privilege. Um, and you never know when it's going to come around again. And, and for me, it never did come back around, but, uh, very grateful that I got to experience those, those forms and, and cherish those memories very fondly. It's true though. Uh, when it, it happens at a young age, you don't know what lies ahead. Do you, you, you probably consider that it's going to happen at least every other year, if not every year, right? Well, yeah, I mean, especially when, when you're young, you're like, okay, I'm going to play uh, hopefully, you know, a long time in the league and, you know, you're, you're going to play a team and uh, it's just, you, you just don't know. You, you don't know what the what the circumstances are going to be. Like, you take a look, there's some players like Jeff Skinner's played a thousand games. He's never played in a, a playoff game, which is, is it's a crazy, crazy. stat. But yeah. there's, there's a few guys like that, that, you know, it's taken them a long time to, to play in the playoffs. And this group has, has an opportunity uh, a well-earned opportunity. And, um, you know, I, I think that's that's always going to be part of the messaging whenever a team embarks on their their playoff season right before game one and the pre-scout meetings. It's like everyone's going to keep that in mind um, as they start things here. That team you played on was, in fact, the last division winner for the Vancouver Canucks until the last North night. West? Was that the Northwest North West division. division back then? Yeah. 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 Yes, this yeah. is the first time they've won the Pacific division it was northwest back then yeah did it mean I anything have... to you does it mean does winning the regular season division title mean anything to a team well okay so I, I only played three regular season games with with the team so i i can't like i wasn't a part of the the bulk right. of that season so i yeah. can't speak to the journey that those players went on and keep in mind it was the lockout shortened year so different than an 82 game grind uh, when I when I played in Utica, we won the division um, my second year, the year that we won the Alder Cup Finals. And there is a, a sense of pride in, in doing something like that. Like, it's a long year. Um, there's ups and downs. There's, there's such a grind to it. I, I think it really is a, a testament to the group and the resilience and the perseverance um, that you are able to put together a season like that and, and emerge victorious among your peers. So... Um, listen, it's not the, it's not the big one. It's not the be all and end all, but it is a nice little, it's a nice little accomplishment. And if anything, 
you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of one of those things where if things do end up going south or you, you don't think your game is in a good spot or, uh, you know, you're down, it's like you kind of remember, hey, we're good. Like, we won the division. We are a good team this year, um, and we should remember that with the way that we played. And it's not a cocky thing. It's more of just a, an assurance that, um, you know, you, you've done the right things all season long, and uh, you deserve to be where you are. Should the conference be meaningful to the Canucks this year? I mean, it's not in their hands. They need a Dallas regulation loss. But is, is that something they should aspire to Thursday if the opportunity presents itself? Sure. I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's not, it's not something that you're necessarily playing for at this point. Um, you know, if, if that's something that happens, I think that's, you know, that just goes back to the same mindset as for winning the division, but they, they are where they are as far as their playoff matchup. They, there's nothing's going to change there. Um, so, as, you know, I, I think it's just, do you want to add another title or a banner or whatever the case may be? Like, I think the, winning the division is, is more important than, you know, the, in this case, anyway, saying you're the Western conference champions, like that's, that's not going to change what the outlook is, what the playoff picture is. Um, they're still, you know, they're still atop their division and um, that's, you know, it's a nice, nice accomplishment for the team. The, the difficulty here is that if Dallas loses and the Canucks have a chance to win that conference, it takes them out of the Nashville Predators sweepstakes, if you will, to face them in the first round. As yeah. we heard from Brian Burke, we've heard from others as well. Teams in their heart of hearts do pick a favorite of who they'd like to face in the first round. If we are to assume that they are like a lot of people and want the Nashville Predators, what does tomorrow night's game look like for the Vancouver Canucks, knowing that you know there's a scenario in which if they win, they don't get to face the Nashville Predators? I, I know, I know. And you know what? So like you look at the options like Vegas and LA uh, both have like games against, you know, inferior opponents, if you want yes. to call it that. Um, so I, I'm kind of uh, operating under the premise that both those teams are going to win. So nothing is going to really change there as far as Edmonton playing Vegas and, um, you know, the the Vancouver Canucks, I guess, at that or sorry. The Dallas Stars would be playing the LA Kings at that point, yeah. right? Am I right there? Yep, yeah, that's right. So, yeah. I, I, you know, if you look back at Nashville's schedule over the last little while, it seems like it seems daunting because they've won a lot of games and they've been playing really well. They haven't beat a lot of playoff teams recently. Like it, it really, they have really mastered their schedule. And, and, you know, they beat the teams that they're supposed to beat, which is what you're supposed to do for sure. But, um, you know, and, and I, I hear a lot of chatter about, you know, if there was going to be one upset in, in the first round, like who would it be and who's a prime candidate? And because Nashville's playing so well and the Vancouver Canucks are kind of new on the block, like maybe that's the one that really sticks out. That's in that's in Vancouver's control. they you know the the narrative is not in their control, but how they play in that series is absolutely going to be. And and with Thatcher Demko coming back and uh, putting together a performance last night, it's like, you know, as much as they're playing well and you're new on the block, you're the division champs. You were the best team in the Pacific. You had a number of great stories in. You're probably going to have the Norris Trophy winning defenseman like. All these things have worked in Vancouver's favor all season long. And, um, you know, Nashville, like I said, like they're, they haven't exactly beaten a bunch of world beaters here recently. They're, they've, they've won the games they're supposed to win, and that's great, but it hasn't been a, a super long schedule for them the last little while. Four, three, and one against playoff teams is Nashville since the start of March. So, yes, very mediocre. And you're quite right. All the wins or many of the wins in that stretch are up against. Uh, playoff also, playoff also rants. Um, forget where I was going here. I had a follow up question. Let's, well, do you want to talk about last night? Let's just dig a little bit deeper. You mentioned the performance by by Thatcher Demko. Is it done? Should you just walk away and be like, it's no worries about Thatcher Demko. He is back. He's ready for game number one. Was that enough to calm any worries for a Canuck fan? I mean, I would hope so. He like he, he had to face 40 shots last night. Like, I, I would hope that's enough to say that the guy is ready to go. Um, and, you know, with, with one more game remaining, I guess, do you, do you kind of say, okay, do we want to give him that, that second one before the playoff starts or do we want to value a little best? And other players have kind of spoke to this as well. 
And sometimes it's not the first game back that gets you because you are playing on a little bit of an adrenaline. It is more like how do you react game two? How does your body feel game two? How does your your your, your body recover? Um, I think that's maybe what the dialogue would be. That's your Demko. But like from what I saw, I'd be fully prepared to say, good for the regular season. Let's fire it up come playoff time. And I don't know when the Canucks are, are going to be scheduled to start their series, if they're going to go Saturday or if they're not going to go Saturday. But um, that's that's probably going to play part of the equation. Well, like if it's a little bit of a a delayed start because they're not going Saturday, then maybe you consider giving him one more game. So it's not that long of a layoff after the, the one game back. So uh, talk to me from a player's perspective. You play in Winnipeg on Thursday. You are going to fly home and arrive in the early morning hours of Friday. Ideally, when would you want your playoff series to start, Frank? Okay, so you're flying home, and then you keep in mind because you're going to Vancouver, you actually gain an hour, which was always nice when we came back from Alberta. And I never went back from Manitoba to Vancouver. It was always we'd start a road trip and seemingly go uh, a bunch of other places for two weeks. So you'll come back. And then, you know, I, I would imagine you probably want you probably want a day off. You probably want at least one practice day. You probably wouldn't hate two practice days. And then you're back into your series. So what is that? Where that that would be that's Monday. Monday. That's yeah. Monday. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's Monday. So there, there you go. Like I, I think that would be perfect. It's not too long. It gives you a, a day of rest. It gives you a day to kind of sharpen things up mentally. Another day to kind of, you know, have a practice where maybe you, you zone in on a couple of the the objectives of what you're going to be doing in that series. And then it's go time. So that you know, I, I don't think you need too much practice. I don't think you need too much uh, time off. But you also don't want to just like jump right into it for the first round of the playoffs. You go deep into the playoffs. And the schedule starts getting tight. Of course, you're going to have to do it. Like you, you play, you win, day off, start the next series. Like that's the reality. A lot of teams are going to be up against that at, in the in the playoffs. But um, for for round one, it's like it's nice to kind of just have that little buffer zone between the regular season and the playoffs. Remember what I was going to uh, ask you earlier. If the Canucks have nothing to play for Thursday, if Dallas takes care of the conference here on Wednesday, would you leave Quinn Hughes at home? Would you rest anybody? Now, yes, I would. Absolutely. Um, this is the topic of conversation where I live. And it's making like it's making me nauseous just hearing mm -hmm. about this all the time because Matthews is chasing 70 and you know the talk. Well, do you rest him? Do you play him? Obviously, play him. He's chasing 70 goals. And he's also not banged up. Like he's not hurt. So what's the purpose in in resting a guy like that? Because realistically he could get hurt in game 82 he could get hurt in game 5 55 four, like you name it anyways with Vancouver they get a totally different scenario all the individuals have kind of accomplished what they have to accomplish the division has been set so with that being said your purpose is there's no purpose in that game so why do you need to play those guys it would be a good idea to give guys a little bit of rest and it's actually like it's been done in the past in Vancouver. Uh, I remember the year that I played um, in the playoffs. We came in Edmonton where both the Twins played one shift so they could keep their Ironman streak alive. I don't think Burroughs played. I don't think Bieksa played. Like I think they played guys like me and Jocelyn and uh, Tommy Sestito played that night. Like There was a little bit of like, hey, there's a couple of the Black Aces that are going to be here, played some games, a couple of the extra guys. Um, there's just what would be the point in rolling out all your guys um, that your season kind of relies on in a meaningless game? So there, there is, there would be a significant purpose in not playing a guy like Quinn Hughes in that game. The only thing for Hughes is just keeping him ahead of McCarr on the points race for optics. But I mean, that's yeah. pretty loose and <laughs> nebulous too. Like what does it even really mean? We don't know. I guess, I guess, I guess you could say that, but um, if you're worried about the Norris, like, I don't think that is going to change right. the Norris in itself. I think, right. yeah, I think yeah. you're right, though. I think, you know, to look back at it and grab the NHL stats page and say, number one, Hughes, number two, McCarr, sure. But uh, when it comes to boards and the ballots, like, I think people have their mind made up by now. Yeah, well, we were hoping for Quinn Hughes to put a couple of points up Tuesday. Uh, well, last he did not. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. who knows? Uh, McCarr may still leapfrog him amongst the uh, defensemen scoring for the defense scoring lead. Incidentally, when he said Jocelyn, 
Do you know who he's referring to? No, I, I had to look it no, up. No, I had no idea. Derek Jocelyn, defense. Yeah. Jocelyn, yes, right, yes. yes. Played. You know uh, why two I know that for the Canucks? That's it. You know why well, that literally came up today? Because he's your part I, of town, is he not? Yeah, he's from here. But I, I remember. I, the reason why that came up is because last night I was in Montreal calling the Habs versus the Red Wings. Slavkovsky scored the four three goal, and that triggered a two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollar performance bonus for him. And I saw a little discourse on Twitter today. I think it was Cam Robinson and Mike John. And apparently Quinton Byfield has an opportunity yes. to trigger two of his performance bonuses with his next goal and his next assist or next point. And, um, you know, the tweet was laid out to Mike Johnson. He's like, I would be going like I would be going as hard as I possibly can for that. And I remembered that game. I believe it was a 7-2 against the Edmonton Oilers at the end of April. And Schultz, Justin Schultz had a goal and three assists. Yakupov had a hat trick. And those guys were going nuts celebrating. And we didn't realize it until afterwards on the bench that those guys all hit performance bonuses in that last game of the year. I guess it was a game 48 that that locked here. Um, yeah, so they all they all hit it with like massive, massive performances against our bare bones team. And uh, Roberto Luongo was in net that night. And Joe Canada was backing him up. Joe had just been kind of called up from, I think, the Chicago Wolves or just finished college. Like he might have just finished at Merrimack. And our good pal Jason Botchford, I remember the next day, was on TSN. And was his thing called, um, was it called Stutter Dud? That his Some, segment yes, yes. that he used At to do with Gino. And I think the dud was keeping Bobby Lou in net that night and not putting Joe Canada in in a Laws game uh, where you're losing a bunch already. Like, just give the guy an NHL start to say he right. got one. And I don't think Joe, I don't know if Joe Canada ever got an NHL start after that. Mm. So you're okay with stat chasing then? Uh, like the Leafs have the goalie out with down three goals, looking for Matthew 70. Uh, there's talk Sydney may play with Malkin tonight because he's three goals shy of Malkin needs a hat trick. Five hundred. Mm-hmm. Although this could well be the last time they ever played against, so it might be a little bit more sentimental than just stat chasing. You're okay with that in these uh, final games, especially I if am. there's nothing I at am. stake. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course I am. Like, you know, this stat chasing is better than, you know, a stat distilling, you know, like healthy scratching Mike Medano in game 1499. Um, you know, like that's, I think that's, that's way more silly than putting guys together on the same line or uh, giving them opportunities to, to chase these milestones. Guys work, like you got to keep in mind, like for the coaching staff, guys work really hard for you all season long they give all they got so you know if you have an opportunity to kind of repay them in 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 this kind of way and give them an opportunity to achieve something um i I think it's okay like i i don't have an issue with that i think it's it's a nice little reward for guys well the other thing is guys the east is completely sad in particular Mm -hmm. so all the eastern games uh, people are paying money to go to those games Mm -hmm. um if you're just trying to you know grind down the clock like that's not much of a show like you you go out and do whatever you want to do is you know people are paying to be there hey eastern conference observers got their show last night and i was texting with frank uh, and sorry frank i didn't realize you were calling the final second i thought you were watching no well so, so i'm watching washington philadelphia and the philadelphia commentators are updating the detroit montreal game right. And they say it's 4-3 Montreal with seven seconds left. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, that's forget about that. Bye-bye Detroit. And then they break in uh, solemnly to declare Detroit has scored with three seconds left. It's now 4-4 and it's going to overtime. Lucas Raymond, man. So I texted Frank, whoa. And he came back with, oh, are you watching this? And I'm like, well, I'm watching Philadelphia, Washington. And it sounds like the Flyers commentators just had their dog die or something like oh, that. Man. Just yeah. how depressed they were. They were also wondering about whether there was a blown icing call that set up that uh, Detroit tying goal. But everything was happening there towards the end of the uh, yeah. Flyers Capitals game and with the Red Wings engaged in Montreal. Well, it was the timing of everything that that really uh, put a nail in the coffin for for Philadelphia and Detroit. Um, so there, Jake Evans goes to clear the puck, and it goes down the ice, and the officials or the alignsman calls it icing. Now, that puck had hit a Detroit Red Wings player's stick. 
the linesmen and referees congregated and then they ultimately decided to bring that puck to center ice and do the face off there so what does that take you know a couple minutes let's say now when when Perron scores the the gate the goal to tie things up with 3.3 seconds left that message did not get to Philadelphia and John Tortorella fast enough to Correct. ultimately prevent him from pulling the goaltender. So you think, oh, maybe if that, that icing situation didn't happen. But I would also say if that was a free-flowing kind of situation and we didn't get that whistle, the Perron goal probably doesn't even happen. That's so, right. So, you know, mm. right, yeah. like that changes that changes the flow of the game as well. The clock could have just been killed and that would have been it. It would have been over. But we were... You know, we were calling that game. We went nuts. We went nuts on our call. Um, Kenny Daniels and Mickey Redmond were in the booth um, just over from us for for Bally's uh, Red Wings broadcast going nuts. And, um, you know, and, and then so as we got the information, my, my play, play-by-play guy, Brian mm-hmm. Mudrick, looks at me and says, well, like, would the players on the bench know that that just happened for Detroit? Like, they're about to start overtime right now. And I said, well, the video coach would have told the head coach or the assistant coach. I'm not sure like they would have conveyed that to the bench in that moment. But after the, the Kane shootout winner, you see the, the really subdued kind of reaction. And it's like, yeah, they, they, they were conveyed that message ultimately. And it was pretty yeah. somber as they were heading off the ice. No, you're quite right. And the Flyers uh, announcers were saying, well, they don't know uh, clearly with the way they're managing that. And, Montreal, Detroit, the last couple of nights, Frankie, just Detroit Absolute. period. Three extraordinary. Three straight last second results yeah. for the Detroit no, Red uh, Three straight. It's honestly, crazy. That, that's the best uh, of the stretch run uh, in NHL action that you want to see right now. And they miss it. And right they, all and that, they miss. And they, and miss. they miss all the but way. They deserve uh, to miss like, it. Like they, they, yeah. they really yeah. do. Like they lost. They, they lost throw they they couldn't put together a a good stretch of hockey with dylan larkin out like um i i went back last night i was doing my notes like after 25 games they had a 640 winning percentage um as of february 28th the red wings were eight points up on the uh in, in the wild card race like eight points into the playoffs it was like a big time collapse by them so they they should never have been in a situation where they hey, were trying to 91 points you shouldn't make the playoffs at 91 points no uh yeah. hey uh last question here just getting back to the connects Tyler Myers says a two point night. Uh, he's one shy of 30. He has been the third most used defenseman for the Vancouver Canucks. And of course, you've got all the uncertainty about Philip Ronick. Um, how much you want Myers back if you're the Canucks for next season? I do. I do because you know what? Another team is going to covet him just because of like the way things are going now where guys that are like big rangy, um, like they're just, they're highly sought after guys. Like we we've seen it the last couple of years come free agency. And um, the thing about Tyler Myers is the team is better around him. The team is more structured around him. Um, they've deployed him, you know, in, in a way that's more suitable to, to his game, like not making him take on too much. So with all that being said, like I, I would love to have Tyler Myers back and, you know, it kind of goes back to the heroic conversation as far as if you have that player. Well, who are you bringing in that's, that makes you better? I think that the Tyler Myers thing is, is also appropriate because if you don't have Tyler Myers, are you bringing in just an, an average guy? And so if you're going to bring in an average guy, I'll take the, the, the average quote unquote guy who's, you know, six foot seven and, and has, you know, has that L as well. Uh, because it, it is hard yeah. to come by. So the the fact that he's playing a, as well as he is, is is really good for, for Vancouver. And um, I, I know Blake Price is is a bit of a fan right now as well, judging by mm-hmm. his tweet last term, night. Term and uh, money honest, matters. Oh. Term and money matters. Yeah. But um, hey, yeah, yeah, I'd have him back. No, but um, we, we've had this conversation all year long. And, and of course, uh, I think the, the fans have been slower to this than, than others because he was a whipping boy for many years yes, here. Right. But he has had... A good solid season. It is clear that Rick Tockett and Adam Foote trust him, yeah. given the ice time that he has played. And he's played with a number of different partners over the yeah. course of the season and, and has looked pretty good in, in that role, too, which can be difficult, I know, Frank, because you know, Hughes and Ronick have been such a constant that it's been Myers who, through injury attrition deployment, has played with a bunch of guys. So well, yeah, and that's, that's uh, a it's a, it's a too, weak right-handed free agent defense market, as it always is. Yeah. And of course, as you know, Frank, like if you're going to trade for one of these guys, you're giving up a ton. Exactly. And you know what? The, the fact that, you know, like in a pinch, you, you put them in a situation, it's like there's a certain amount of, you know, time on on uh, where, where you can you can 
be put in that situation and play well. Maybe it's not a, a and you're in all the time but you know like like you said like Heronic goes down or, or something happens like he's 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 a good guy to slide into that situation it's not going to be a permanent thing but at least you know you get some good reps you get some good games and uh that kind of buys you time until your your kind of premier guys let's say um are able to come back hey everybody if you're enjoying what you're seeing here then follow along with Sakaris and Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now. In a season like this, you never want to miss a single second of what's happening on the ice. And you want to be around your fellow fans, right? Well, Greta Bar YVR at 50 West Cordova, the perfect spot to do so. Hey, if you've got tickets, a great place to pre and post. They've got drink specials every single day. And if you don't have tickets, well, stick around and soak up the atmosphere with all your fellow fans, play all the great video games and air hockey, great air hockey set up as well at Greta Bar YVR. We'll see you there, 50 West Cordova. Northlands Golf Course. Download the free app and book tee times with a touch of your thumb. And while you're on course, open the app for hole-by-hole -hole GPS and track your score. Six to 90-day reservations. Jump the queue. Lock in your date for $10 per player booking fee. Limited daily availability. Check it all out. Golfnorthlands.com. Our guest is Rob Williams, the national sports editor of the Daily Hive and its offside sports vertical. Rob, the hockey guy on Twitter, Grady Sass. Get that handle right. And he joins us now. How you doing, Rob? Doing great, guys. I'm, I'm ready for the playoffs to begin. Mm -hmm. Are we all? Are we yeah. all? I, I le left the press box last night, and uh, Daniel Wagner said bye to Daniel Wagner, and he said, see you at game one. And uh, him and I have been covering this team for a few years, and we've never been to a playoff game uh, as media. So a uh, long time coming, and... Uh, and I, I think the whole city's jacked about this. Mm -hmm. They hitting their stride. You feeling good about them? Confident heading in? I am. I mean, I, th I think everyone for about a month was going, ooh, like this team is heading for a first round exit, right? Like they didn't look great without Demko. And there were, you know, other, I think other warts with, with their game. You know, they went, they went a month in between cheating a playoff team, uh, had those, you know, Stinkers against Vegas and LA. Um, you know, the Western Conference is so good this season. Like they no matter who they play, like they can they could be beaten in the first round. But you know, this last week I think has given, you know, consumer confidence is 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 high again and I think in this team. And you know, having that uh having that big win in Edmonton, I know it was up without McDavid, but the Canucks were without Demko, having that performance and you know, I know it's it's only the Calgary Flames, but you get the goal from Miller. You get the great play from Pedersen. Demko looks sharp. Uh, depth scoring is good. Even Ilya Mikheyev's looking good again, guys. Like like you know, there's they they seem to be hitting their stride. Elias Lindholm is looking pretty good since he returned from injury. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I'm I think I'm feeling definitely feeling better about them. And I, th and I think they're, they're maybe starting to hit the stride right at the right time. I did a, uh, uh, I did an Expedia search yesterday, $630 round trip to Vegas or to um, Nashville and back. We know Vegas and LA flights are plenty. You think, <laughs> uh, think Canucks fans go on mass to Nashville? If that's the case. Hey, all three, all three possibilities right now are pretty nice uh, tourist destinations. destinations. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Hey, yeah, your your off night in any of those cities it's could be as fun. good as your on night at the game. But I was surprised how reasonable that was for Nashville. Six hundred thirty bucks is not crazy if you look uh, at what flights anywhere cost these days. So maybe I mean uh, the playoff series is is such a unique opportunity to see the Canucks on the road, right? Because you get the two games, you can you can make it a kind of a you know go for four days and, and, uh, and, you know, catch an NHL game. Uh, yeah. That's I, all, that's maybe, all you can handle. I, I, yeah. I mean, it's a long, that's a long trip. Right. But uh, you know, I, yeah, if you can get 630 bucks, I think people will probably be down for that. Four days Why in not? Nashville or Vegas is a long time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I would, you guys, I, I, I came back from Vegas just, uh, just about a week ago. And I said to the guys when we, when we left, I was like, I've never left Vegas and thought, man, we could have done another night there. 
No, no. <laughs> it's always either. time to come home. In, in <laughs> fact, no. I've declared upon leaving Vegas every single time. That is the last time I go yeah. to Las Vegas. No, I, it was three <laughs> nights for us last month, and we both sort of looked at each other, uh, you know, as we're sitting by the pool on Monday with not a lot of energy going, yeah, that's that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need no more. Okay, let's ask you the poll question. Who do you most want to avoid in round one? L.A., Nashville, Vegas. I think part of you has to be thinking L.A. just because the Canucks have played them so poorly. Although I think L.A. kind of caught Vancouver at the right time. I think they caught them during that month where they weren't really uh, at the top of their game. I think the answer has to be Vegas, right? Mark Stone is, there's nobody doubts that he's coming back for game one. Um, you know, make, making those those additions at the deadline. I know their form hasn't really shown it, but I think they've got to be the scariest team. I think they're a team that could just turn it on in round one and and, and you're in trouble. Or they're done in five games. <laughs> I don't Honestly. think they'll be done in five games. I mean, I think you, you, you could end up with a I mean, I, I think that's a series the Canucks could still win. I mean, they could win that in, that series in seven, I think. But... I think that's a that's a tough tough test to to play Vegas. Um, I think everyone isn't everyone cheering for Dallas tonight. I think I think Canucks fans want Nashville. I know you know the the long travel, but you know, but I think that's I think that's the the matchup that you want. As we've been saying though, the, you, the unfortunate thing is is that yeah. you want Dallas to face Vegas to get Vegas into the other bracket, right? Like, I, I, if the Canucks, if you're going to allow yourself to, to put cart before horse here and you're allowed to put the Canucks into the second round, wouldn't you rather the Canucks face the Kings in the second round rather than Vegas? The Kings I or think, Oilers? I think so. And I think mm -hmm. also you could, I could uh, dream up a scenario where, you know, L.A. kind of gets lucky and squeaks by Edmonton and you end up facing L.A. Whereas I feel like if Vegas and Edmonton play each other, the winner of that team is like they've just proven themselves like to be the best team in the league because they, they, just they, they could be spent though too. They could yeah. be they could be That's spent. Uh, I gotta say I have very little confidence that either LA or Vegas are going to lose, uh, given their opponents uh, being Anaheim and Chicago. Yeah. So uh, but who knows? Yeah. You know, stranger things. Uh, stranger things have happened. You don't think um, the conference matters? To fans, do you think it should matter for the team? I, I I don't feel like I've seen Canucks fans talk much about winning the conference. I think that people almost kind of forgot about it. Um, I think it was all about winning the division. Uh, I think being first in the league was cool for a while. I don't know that that matters too much, um, which, is, which is kind of crazy. I mean, that would be... I believe that would be the third time in franchise history that they would have ever won their conference. I mean, that's an incredible achievement to win your conference. But I don't think anyone wants any part of the Vegas Golden Knights. And I think people think, geez, that second slot sounds pretty good, which I do wonder about, like, in terms of, like, oh, be careful what you wish for. I mean, remember the last time we had playoff hockey in, in, at Rogers Arena in 2015? everyone was celebrating the fact that they got the Calgary flames in round one. Like that was the easiest opponent they could have possibly received. And I think they actually were the easiest opponent they could have possibly received. The problem was they still lost to them. So uh, I think you, you want to be careful what you wish for, but I think, totally. you know, the, the, I think the other teams are probably wishing they are probably hoping that they get Vancouver as well. Right. Like I think, Whoever gets the Canucks is going to be like Nashville right now does not want Dallas. I don't think, I think they want the Canucks and I think the same is probably true for the Kings and the golden Knights. So I think it's, it, it might go, go both ways there. Rob, we have got to talk about team awards. <laughs> What's going on here? What, what is going Rob, on? Rob, explain this one to us. Cause I don't know how many polls we ran over the course of the season. But Quinn Hughes won in landslides in terms of team MVP best player. He's the captain. He's the, he's Huggy Bear. Mm -hmm. And and hey, JT Miller had a great season, but he this, sure did. But the, the I, I thought it was good. I thought it was close. I even had people chastising me for saying it's close, but my vote is Hughes. And yeah, um, yeah. but yeah. if it's a popularity contest, doesn't Hughes win that? Like I just don't understand how we mm, arrived at this. I'm not sure he wins that. I. Yeah, I'm, I'm that this one surprised me. And 
yeah, I, I don't, I, I, I mean, he's, he's going to win the Norris trophy for crying out loud. <laughs> like, and nobody's done that in Canucks history. It, it's incredible that, that, that Hughes didn't win team MVP. I mean, this takes nothing away from JT Miller. Like no. Miller's having one of the highest scoring seasons uh, in Canucks history, you know, surpassing a hundred points. Like what a, just a tremendous, tremendous season from Miller. Uh, but I think a conventional wisdom, like, like, you know, I, I was writing writing my article, getting ready for the for the announcements, and and had pre written Hughes into MVP because I thought that you know that that Hughes was going to get it. So that one did catch me by surprise. But this has been something I've been on about with with Team MVP. It's amazing how many times I think the fans get it wrong. And if you look back at like the old Team MVPs, Henrik Sedin won Team MVP twice. Like he won the heart. It took until winning the heart trophy until he got team MVP. Daniel Sidine is probably the second best player in Canucks history. He's won it twice only as well. And then you look at the other guys that have won team MVP, like Radam Verbata got team MVP in 2014, 2015. Like did, did fans think that Verbata was driving the Sidine Verbata line? Like that was kind of, <laughs> kind of crazy. Uh, you know, you look on the list, there's Alex Ald won it in 05, 06. Like it seemed like every time, like they could have given it to a Sedin, but it went to someone else or it went to the goalie, went to, you know, Kessler, Kessler won it one year. So, um, or Kessler won it twice, I should say. Uh, Jacob Markstrom won it twice. So it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of an odd one there. Like to that, that, uh, you know, when you look back at, in the history of, of, uh, of team awards. We talked about it with her phone yesterday that, uh, you know, the fans like to dole out off. Oh, I'm voting for this guy here. I'm going to vote for this guy. There. You know, yeah. trying to Social keep it bad. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Trying to keep one most exciting hey, you player. Know, you, get well. an award and you get an award and you get an award. But you're yeah. right. Wow. The one most exciting player, right? Like that, that was I the think, part that got me. Cause normally, yeah. well, normally that gets, that gets shared. The MVP doesn't typically get most exciting player. Well, uh, what I think happened is people filled out best defenseman. Oh my God, it's got to be Quinn Hughes, and then work from there on the ballot. I'm still surprised. Like af after all, this is not Elections Canada running this uh, this whole voting. Uh oh, are you saying it's rigged? I, I, no, don't go don't go at those voting machines. I'm, They're litigious. I'm disappointed they didn't rig it. Like if I like if I'm the Canucks, I think it's more appropriate that Quinn gets two and JT gets one. Hey. All he wants to find is uh, eight thousand votes in Georgia. That's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but uh, like, if if I'm the Canucks, I'd be like, "Ooh, that looks weird." Let's just, let's give Quinn one of these and and like, or you know, one of the exciting and MVPs, so that he has two at the end of the night. Did uh, Hughes and Miller have scrutineers watching the count? You know, you know what, guys? Like the the thing that I think shows just how you know we're, we've been talking about Hughes setting these you know awards like. Canucks defenseman awards. And I think, and I think that everyone's kind of bored with him breaking those records because they're not all that impressive right. records. And he's such an impressive uh, <laughs> defenseman. Uh, he's now won best defenseman five years in a row. Uh, this is an award that not long ago was won by Ben Hutton as a rookie and Troy Stetcher as a rookie. Like this is the they, they won best defenseman, really? Ben it was Ben Hutton in 2016, Troy Stetcher in 2017. Edler won it in back-to-back -back years in 2018 and 2019. And now Hughes has won it five straight years. So that, I think that kind of shows uh mm -hmm. you know the, the the level that we're at on on defense now for, for Quinn Hughes. Yeah, and um I think he's going five more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, as long I, as he stays healthy, I, yeah. I, how does he, he not stays, win? If he stays healthy, he is going to sweep the decade. They may, in fact, rename this the Quinn Hughes Award in time. <laughs> uh, That's probably true too. We yeah. shall see. Uh, Rob, great stuff today. Thank you for this, my friend. And we'll catch up next week when we'll know playoff matchups and heck, probably even have a game or two. Should be fun. Yeah, Look we'll be hand wringing our, our, you know, over uh, over a loss or or. or overreacting to a win. I can't wait. Yes. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the two. Hey, everybody. If you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Secure Some Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. It, they call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.